So this salon, a number of you have been, many of you have been to salons that we've had uh, that are part of our grant from the Templeton World Charity Foundation. And so we are always very grateful to be able to host these salons around their giving priorities. And this one falls under human flourishing and economics. I think a topic that is relevant to everyone here. Um, and it's the first time we've actually done a salon around this uh, giving priority that, that Templeton has. And so I wanted to briefly introduce Tracy, who manages this priority at, at the foundation, because I'm very casual, and she probably is less casual as the person who's giving the money <laughs> about this giving area. <laughs> Do you want to give a few words about it, and then we'll, we'll get started? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us this evening. Um, on behalf of Tina Cambridge, the president of the Templeton World Charity Foundation, I would like to say welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Templeton World Charity Foundation is located in Nassau, Bahamas. Um, and we are a philanthropic, we are one of three philanthropic organizations that were founded by Sir John Templeton, who was a well-known financier. And Sir John wanted his philanthropies to focus on the things that will encourage or assist people in living lives with meaning and purpose. And so the Economics and Human Flourishing Fund uh, that Susan was uh, mentioning is trying to do just that in that we are looking for researchers around the globe who are trying to solve some, either some very sticky problems in their countries or who have an interest in sort of um, human flourishing and using the, the tools or the research tools of economics to solve some very um, important problems. I could go on and on forever about the research projects that we have. Currently we have 27 different grants in about 15 to 20 different countries. Um, How long are the grants all for? Are they? So they're anywhere from 24 months, two years, mm. to three years. We have funded uh, over $7 million um, of projects. Um, and you can always visit our website to learn sort of more about the initiatives and the funding area and the types of researchers that we're looking for. Um, but I said to Samson earlier this evening, mm. I think I have the best job in the world. You definitely have a really great job. Samson has a really good job. I had coffee with him the other day. Wait, you have a great job. Yeah, yeah, he's a good job, too. But I, I find people who are passionate about what they do. And I try to, you know, find funding for them to do it. So that's I'm going to... Yeah. I guess turn Hand the evening over to our guest. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And go find your seat before someone else nabs yeah, it. I so I, as I... <laughs> So I realized for a little bit of context, as, as I know some of you, but most of you have been here before, but some of you haven't. I mean, a salon, what could be more New York? Do you walk in here for the first time, you're like, yes, this is what I've come to New York for. But my background is about 20, 25 years in Silicon Valley, where I ran a PR agency, and you name it, and I might have represented them. Um, but, and I was deeply, and I am deeply into tech. However, I grew up in a pretty analog world, as we all did in life, and the value to me of hanging out slightly sweaty, I might be sweating a little, and these, in these close quarters up near each other is invaluable. And we're all hungry for it, which we can tell from the size of the number of people here in this room. Uh, so tonight, I'm going to chat with Hilda and, and introduce, Hilda will introduce herself to us, her points of view and her life as I ask her some question, questions. Hilda Ochoa Brillenberg, she has a, huh, a magnificent bio, which I'm not going to be able to get all the way through it. Look, she is an economist. She's so accomplished. She's an immigrant from Venezuela. She was a single mom. Uh, she went to Harvard Business School as a single mother in the 70s. Were you the only one at the time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm uh, a witness. Yeah, the wit witness. Um, she's a philanthropist. She's an author. She's been on boards of many, many companies and still is on them. And she's also uh, the, the founder of Orchestra of the Americas. So... I suddenly realized this evening, I'm going to do this interview entirely differently from how I had planned to do it. Um, we'll add lib it a little bit. But Orchestra of the Americas, she will, is going to tell us about. But we have some musicians here, and they're going to perform throughout the evening. So I thought what would be really make sense is we start off with, like, 
what is Orchestra of the Americas? I, I didn't know about it, which is embarrassing, but all of my very good musician friends love Orchestra of the Americas. What is it, and, and why was music for you a vehicle for, for change? Huh. What is? What is and how is it evolving, and how, is, how it has evolved? What it is is an institution, a not-for-profit institution, which, which tries to be profitable. We do believe in the marketplace, and we do try to be fiscally conservative and sustainable in what we do. But we are an organization right now which rests on two major pillars. The first one is, is from our very beginning, is an orchestral academy, a conservatory. The difference is, originally, we used to tour. We used to be like what it's called in America, a festival orchestra. Mm. We would pull great musicians. In fact, we would find the best musicians we could, could find in 35 countries in the Americas, pull, select them, pull them together, have them congeal over a period of 10 days, bringing in the best teachers we could find. Mm. And we'll probably have a chance to talk about why mm. do I say they're the best teachers we could find. And then they would tour. Once they were congealed as an orchestra, they would tour. And that orchestra became um, one of the best, if not the best, youth orchestra in the world. We were now called to perform in some of the major halls. We became famous for our performances. Mm. And that model was not sustainable. Mm. And there this sounds like a lot of work, constantly yeah, that moving, is not a lot of moving parts. Yeah, and it was not sustainable largely because of musicians' unions which forbid anybody to pay for a foreign orchestra to get into a country and compete in a way for performances with local orchestras, which I understand. I understand perfectly well, but that model was not sustainable. And thank goodness, COVID came. Oh, wow, so you and changed that COVID recently. COVID came, COVID huh. came, and in March of that year, when it became clear to us that this was not going to go away immediately, we had already selected the orchestra for that year, and we were going to have a residency in Panama, and then we're going to perform in Russia in what was to be the celebration. It was going to be a peace concert called by Putin and, fina <laughs> and financed by Putin and Gergiev. And we were invited to be the Orchestra of the Americas to perform there. Well, that was, it became clear to us that was not to be. We had already selected an orchestra. And then I should introduce, where's Mark? Mark Gillespie, the CEO of the, no, of the right orchestra, here, yes. right there. And that beautiful man with a great mind and, and, and creativity, we put our heads together mm -hmm. and we decided, okay, we've selected an orchestra. We cannot leave those musicians who are counting on this tour, left hang, uh, dry to hang. And we said, well, let's start. We had already experienced, and this is the second pillar of the orchestra. We had already experienced with distance learning and become very good at it mm. through our Global Leaders Institute. I'll talk about it in a minute. So we put our, all of our technology, which I'd already developed, into actually in, into having a distance learning um, experience with the musicians we had selected. We brought in all the unemployed at that time, musicians all over the world, including Yo-Yo Ma so and everyone else. Probably no so one was performing. They were thrilled to have yeah. something to do. And, they, and that became the beginning of our online music conservatory. Mm which is called the O Academy. So that's one pillar. The other pillar is the Global Leaders Institute because we realized about 10 years into our experience with the orchestra that most of our musicians, what they really wanted to do, particularly the Latin American musicians, was to impact their community. Why is that? Because most of them were, had a very poor upbringing. And for them, music had been a means to come out of poverty. Mm. They were paid attention to, their families respected them, they had an audience. Even if they were not great musicians, they, were, uh, they evolved to become great musicians. They moved on up. They moved of, on yeah. up. Yeah. And they were acknowledged by their community. So the, they really wanted to have an impact on their community, mm. to be leaders. Mm -hmm. When did we discover that? We discovered that because we went on a European tour, which was fantastic. They were performing in some of the major halls in, in Europe. But there were no poor communities to talk to in Europe and to show their wares and to impact these poor kids who wanted to see music as a, as a way out of poverty. Mm. And they actually complained. 
that they did not want to do that oh, anymore. So they want to go back to They their wanted countries. to go back to communities that were poor where there could be role models to, to the poor kids in those communities. Mm. Did they worry about so, um, being financially independent or being able to make a living? They was were worried. Everyone's worried about that. Mm. Everyone is. Mm. And they were too. But they, they really felt they would be realized as human beings. Mm by the way in which they could impact their communities and other kids from poor backgrounds like them. So we started the Global Leaders Institute. That is now that's the second pillar. So we have the O Academy, the Music Conservatory, which aims to be as good or better than Curtis. And I could say that there are some reasons why we could, we could be different and arguably better. Well, you know, in many, the in many ways, but we'll ahead. talk about that. But okay. the other one was the, the Global Literacy Institute, which is now granting an MBA for artists, not is just this, for is musicians. Is this a first for artists? First for artists. Mm. First MBA for artists, because we realized and they realized that they had fantastic training, but very narrow training in music. And they wanted to manage organizations, NGOs that would impact their communities. And some were managing them, and they were doing a very bad job. Mm. Like many people, many, many performing <laughs> arts organizations and non-performing arts organizations are poorly managed. And uh, we set, set in place a program. We actually partner with seven of the major universities in the United States and Canada. And, uh, and now we're granting an MBA degree in, in one year. And uh, I think we have one graduate from the program Two. who's here tonight. But the, the uh, and that has been amazing. How do we know it's amazing? Because one, they say it's amazing, but you know, people always say that things are amazing because, they, because they're groupies, you know. No, but we know they're amazing because we survey how much they make over the next two to three to five years. And all of them, are the report is that on average, they get their revenues increase by 30% in two years and 50% in five years. So they're becoming more financially independent right, and in a sustainable manner, more in a more entrepreneurial. And, yeah. Okay, that's, that's I'll amazing. stop there. Yeah, no, well, I mean, so I wanted to do this sort of up front so that as we have the musicians uh, perform this evening, you would, you would know a little bit about the background before we take a wander around Hilda's past and mm -hmm. other, other achievements. Should we do a little music? Yes. Yeah, let's do a little music. <laughs> They're not going to play any classical music. They're going to play when they were asked to play whatever they wanted to play. And they have chosen some folk music from their home countries. Good evening. Uh, I'm Juan Diego. Uh, this is Anna. And we are part of the O group. We're also students at uh, Bard College at Mount Conservatory. Uh, we both do the uh, dual degree program. So my second major. Besides being a percussionist, I do computer science and I know those economics. So you have no free time at all, basically. <laughs> but thanks for coming here tonight. Thank you yeah. for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we will be playing some Venezuelan folk music. We'll be playing Como Llora Una Estrella, or uh, in English, The Way a Star Cries. Um, and it's going to be playing the violin, and I'm going to be playing the cuatro. It's a Venezuelan folk instrument with uh, four strings. That's why it's called Cuatro. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting instrument, uh, especially from a percussionist uh, standpoint, because it's very percussive. So you'll hear me doing a lot of this kind of sounds in my playing. Um, so I hope you like it. Thank you.
Thank you. Is there more? Okay, no, I just wanted to make sure we weren't going to cut you off. Thank you so much. Um, briefly back to OA, and then let's, let's talk about s some other things in your background. Um, will the MBA program be expanding beyond musicians? It has expanded it has, beyond okay, musicians. It has. Higher, higher yeah. education is ready yeah. to be disrupted, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we and, know that. Uh, Yes, we started being an organization to favor the Americas. And now we have become a global organization. I see. We continue favoring the Americas, but we concluded, you know, Harvard started with the Divinity School. Mm, I was just and there now, earlier this and week. And now they yeah. have a business school and many right, other right. schools. So like Harvard, we are changing expanding. our colors and expanding and becoming more global. Uh, same thing with the, with the Global Leaders uh, Institute. It started being just musicians and at the, at the request of ballet dancers and other artists. We have now expanded the program and now 25% of our cohort is non-musicians. They include photographers, filmmakers, uh, museum curators, ballet dancers. Salon has. Huh? <laughs> Anyone else who wants to pro who wants to train and get an MBA, an MBA on in in innovation and social impact mm. in artist innovation and social impact, it's um, it's a great program. And and one final question, because we have a great audience here. I mean, are there any sorts of partners that you're looking for? We have partners yeah, in all of our operations. Yeah. We have, as I told you, we have Harvard and yeah. Harvard and and uh, Duke and Georgetown and Stanford and now the University of Chicago is teaching the yeah. economics module. So we have partners everywhere. We have the we have Curtis. You're gonna, Curtis you're gonna have a flurry of applications. No, we're the looking next for week, partners to help us fund our expansion okay. and and uh, all of our programs. We're looking for partners to start a voice lab in the in the music conservatory we have in addition to all the orchestral instruments. We have um, um, a directorial uh, mm. director um, uh, fellowship. We have a piano lab, and Vanessa has been playing as part of mm. that piano lab. Vanessa Perez here, Venezuelan. Mm. You can tell anyone who's Venezuelan because they had tears in their eyes when you hear no. that. <laughs> when you hear that oh, song. Okay, yeah. so we have a sense. Now, well, let's rewind uh, back to the beginning-ish. You grew up in Venezuela, and, and I heard you say in an interview that you had a very free childhood. Yeah. Free childhood. What does that What does that mean? What were your parents like? It means I had an underprotective mother, <laughs> completely underprotective. I could have become a vagabond. I mean, I am a little bit of a vagabond. I could have become a drug addict. All of those possibilities were open <laughs> for me. And I had a pilot father, so I oh, never. Oh, so you knew about. You know, I knew I was alone in my in my upbringing, and which served me well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, that made me be very self-caring and protected mm. and ambitious, and mm. so I spent my childhood riding first a tricycle and then a bike all over the neighborhood mm. on my own and jumping from buildings into they were in construction into big sand piles. <laughs> I can tell you, it's one of the most fun things to do. <laughs> so yes, I was free. Mm. I didn't have a curfew. Uh, when I was a teenager, I would yeah. go to discotheques until four o'clock in the morning. How did you end up in boarding school in Upper State New York? Because my mother wanted me to learn English. I see. And uh, part of the challenge, I was in, in Upstate New York in Tuxedo Park. Part of the challenge was that they had a student council who was supposed to trap any of the Latino girls, there were 30 of us, who were speaking Spanish. Uh -huh. And then if you were caught speaking Spanish, I would not let you out on the weekend. Oh, uh, uh, Which was fine with me because I didn't have a place to go out on the weekends yeah. anyway. <laughs> so, but then around April or May, I realized, well, I better learn some English mm. before I go back and speak no word of English. Mm. So I learned all the English I could learn in, in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Um, you then got married, you, you had a, a child, and you became a, a single mother um, uh, and applied to Harvard Business School. Yeah, applied to the Department of Economics. Oh, Department of Economics, um, and, and got in. And got in. And, and I love this story. A woman ha kept her eye out for Hilda, a Mrs. Fisher. Yes, Carla and, Fisher. Yeah, Carla Fisher. And, and she applied. This couldn't possibly happen now. 
Um, she applied for a Fulbright for you. Yes. Wow. Yes. I mean, talk about looking out for another yeah. person, another woman looking out for yeah. another woman. Isn't yeah. it? I don't know. When I heard that, it made me cry a little bit, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. Is wonderful. It's very kind. She was a Holocaust survivor. Wow, the kindness. She was a Holocaust survivor. Yeah, the and kindness. I tried to find her. Yeah. I kept in touch with her for many yeah. years. And then I lost touch when I moved to the United States, and I would not go as frequently to Venezuela. Yeah. I lost touch with her when I was working at the World Bank. She changed your life, right? She changed yeah. my life. Yeah. But as a result of that experience, because I was desperate, I had been admitted to Harvard, and mm -hmm. I thought finding financing to go to Harvard will not be a problem. Well, mm -hmm. my parents didn't have the money. Yeah. And I, there were scholarships in Venezuela, but only for public employees. Public, I mean, government, government scholarships for public employees. There was nothing in the private sector, and I had been working in the private sector. So that experience was terrifying, horrendous, stressful. Mm -hmm. I had a peritonitis as a result of that in my mm -hmm. third year, third day at mm -hmm. Harvard. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, when I, I would, when I went back to Venezuela during Christmas holidays uh, in 1973. I spoke to my one and only political contact in the country. Uh, they were, his party had won the election. Said, do you realize that the amount of money that's going to come to Venezuela? Mm. Because it was the oil crisis, mm. which was not a crisis for oil exporting countries. It was a boom for them. Mm. And he said, you could change the, the trajectory of the country with this money. I said, what would you do? And I said I would create a massive scholarship program, a massive scholarship program. Any Venezuelan, whether they have the grades or they don't have the grades, it doesn't matter. L have them leave the country because at that time all the Venezuelan univer public universities were just uh, nests of communist training. Mm -hmm. And the country was really headed for, I mean, Fidel had tried to take over the country mm -hmm. in the 60s. And, was not able to, but it was always, I always fear that that would happen. And when indeed it did happen, Cuba took over Venezuela. But anyway, and they created the program. And under that program, there were, no one knows the number, but around 60 to 100,000 Venezuelans went to study abroad. Wow. Which was, I'm very proud How of that. How many went back? I that's mean, a dream I had. Well, yeah, all of them yeah, went, back. went back. Now, many of them have left. That's what I yeah. mean. What, what's many your relationship with risk? I mean, you were a young, single mom, and you went off to Harvard. So was it risk or not? Like, it was, yes. Do you have a relationship <laughs> with risk? <laughs> I do. First, I, I think you have to be a risk taker in life. Mm. But you have to be a risk taker uh, to know, to, and, but you have to know how to hedge your risks. Mm. So you need, you, need a, you need a safety net, always need a safety net. Financial, social, uh, like Whatever. I mean, many times you don't have financial safety nets many times yeah. in life. When I started my firm after my 12 years at the World Bank, I had procured enough capital and assets under management that I had a, a safety net. Mm. And I had married Arturo, who was working and mm. making an income. That's another financial <laughs> safety net. <laughs> Who you marry? So, so. It is. No one ever wants to say that. But so, that's no, but that's important. Who you marry, and, and you're diversifying your financial and your emotional risks when you pick a partner. Yeah. Then I mean, you better pick a good one. So, so after HBS, you, I mean, after Harvard, you went back to Venezuela. How did that feel after being in America, which is like free markets, and you know, it was America in the '70s? How was that when you went back to Venezuela, which was maybe a little bit? a different sort of environment at yeah, the time was, for business. It was good and bad. Mm. It was good because I was a, it was a rarity. I, you know, I had a degree from Harvard. I mm. was barred. I, was, I had been trained differently than most other Venezuelans. So I started getting hired by a lot of people. I so see. I remember my first year there, I made about $100,000, which was like a million today. So it, well, that part of it was very good, and I had great opportunities uh, to consult with both the private and the, and the public sector. Mm -hmm. What felt bad to me was I was still divorced, I had a kid, <laughs> and uh, most of the men who were asking me out were married. And I did try that, by the way, I did try that out, I didn't like it. So, I think um, it's hard to hide you, like you're not really a sideshow. <laughs> I could be. I could be a side Maybe, show. Maybe, but yeah. I don't think so. We were, we were, like, we were discreet, let me put it that way. But not but I, And I had concluded, and I, and I started being drained by, by the lack of, 
deep, not that people are not intelligent, of course they're very intelligent and they're ambitious and they work hard, but I started being drained by not having enough intellectual depth mm. and breadth mm. among the people I was meeting, other than the married men. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I felt, you know, I really need to redo my family. I need to find a husband. Mm. I need to have, find a new father for, mm. for my, Andres's first father. His natural father was a bit of an absentee father as well. <laughs> so, and that's good and bad. And then I, I started looking for a husband. I mm. mean, diligently looking for a husband. <laughs> so. So Apparently you did well, yeah. No, yeah, I did very well. You have a great well. friend over there. No, I did very well. Mm. So you went to the World Bank. What was that like as, as an economist? Any takeaways from your 12 years as chief investment officer of... It's a, the the World Bank. Bank is an extraordinary organization. With the, they have, they, and I still probably they still do. They really pick the best and the brightest mm. around the world with mm. extraordinary academic training. So in that sense, I felt very comforted, and I learned an enormous amount at the World Bank. But it is, it is an autocracy. It is a political organization. It is not a free market organization, mm. talking about, about free markets. Does it stifle entrepreneurs? Does it promote entrepreneurs? It does not promote entrepreneurship. Uh, I was lucky, and on purpose, I had picked the job that, no, in a way, no one else wanted, which was to manage the pension fund, mm -hmm. which at the time, that was not a glamorous job. Mm. It did eventually become a glamorous job, but I thought that would be a terrific job because the pension fund had been doing horribly. Mm. Two, I had been trained in portfolio theory at the, in the doctoral program at the Harvard Business School, which I thought I would never use when I went back to Venezuela, and I would have never used it there. Uh, so I could use it now managing these global pension assets. And... Um, and I could, do, I could be creative because no one was paying attention no was to paying whatever attention. was going on in the pension plan. <laughs> and that's the way it turned out to be. Mm. So I was there for 12 years. So um, both from your experience there, but also as an investor, is there anything, I mean, there's probably many things, that geopolitically right now we're not paying enough attention to but that you think we should? Well... Uh, I am paying attention to everything that's going on. Yeah. So I don't know what other people are not paying mm. attention to. What, what's on your mind I right don't now? Think that maybe the press isn't writing enough. I mean, I'm, I, I, yeah. this is not my forte, yeah. but maybe it's... I am, I am uh, and I don't want to touch any, any wrong chords here right. or, or push the wrong buttons. Yeah. I am worried that the major preoccupation of thinking and compassionate and feeling people is global warming. And I think global warming in the least of problems that I think the world is encountering as we speak and will be encountering mm. even in, in bigger yeah. ways is probably eighth or ninth, if that. Yeah. Um, I think the so it is geopolitical. I mean, it's really geopolitical. Yeah, that is geopolitical. That, really that is geopolitical. Yeah. And the destruction that that's creating in the policy making, as they should, you know, to people who believe there is global warming and it will be a calamity, and we are causing it, and fuels are causing it, and that's creating, um, that is one, creating an enormous amount of money being spent on trying to stop it, and when I don't think it's a real problem, that's my personal belief, I don't want to push wrong buttons here, but I really read a lot about it, and, uh, but not enough attention is paying to what is going to be the demographic crisis around the world, mm -hmm particularly in the developed countries mm. like Japan, China, the United States, and Europe, in which you have people who are in aging, terms of aging, aging and not, at a yeah. very fast pace and there is not enough money to take care of their health. Mm -hmm. They can take care of some of their retirement, but there's absolutely no money to take care of the health of the old people. Mm. And I think that will create an enormous intergenerational problem mm. because the young people will protest. Mm. One, and, one more question yeah. before we move to some music. Um, again, how do you think, as we're speaking about geopolitics uh, lately, um, how do you do you think music can be used at all to promote democracy around the world? D and democracy. Do you work, yeah, and do you work with the State Department? We have worked with the State Department. Mm -hmm. We don't get any government funding. Mm -hmm. I think 99% of our resources come from the private sector. Mm -hmm. And, but we have received a little bit of money from the State Department whenever we had the orchestra touring. Mm. The embassies would give us the maximum they can give, 
which is five thousand dollars when we were presenting yeah. in different countries, and that was very budgets. welcome. It's a small it budget, yeah. Small potatoes. The uh, the um, uh, we don't get government funding. We're private sector funded. Can music help solve the problems of the world? Music and artists can definitely not make them worse. Yeah. And they can definitely, and they can definitely. Here we all are, right? Yeah. People like this is a cross generational people from different backgrounds. Yeah. Brings people together. And they, they definitely sense. musicians, artists, and their audiences, and anyone who's touched by any artistic uh, action or any endeavor, any artistic endeavor, is changed. It, mm. it feeds the soul if you believe the soul exists. Mm. I kind of believe the soul is a cord that connects the heart to the mind. A cord? But you can have your own a beliefs cord. of where the soul lies. But anyone who's touched by artistry, who do let themselves be touched by artistry, will feel differently about the world. Mm. Will have a more open mind. Mm. Will think of possibilities that they might not have thought before. And I'm hopeful, and, and certainly we believe that we are playing a role in that. But more than anything else, we believe we're playing a role in allowing musicians in their own ways, those who are entrepreneurial and want to uh, manage NGOs, to find ways of impact their communities mm -hmm. and move them out of poverty or loneliness or... Relying on others or relying on government handouts? Without necessarily. Without no, no, we're teaching them not yeah. to rely on government handouts. Yeah. We're teaching them to use the marketplace mm -hmm. to, uh, to develop things that, are, that the market will accept as necessary. And some people will pay for it and some people will not be able to pay for it. And then you find the resources to, to give them scholarships. Mm. Some music? Should we have some music? Yeah. I think after that, let's have some music. Yeah. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Hugo Valverde. I'm a horn player. It's my instrument from Costa Rica. Um, I was an orchestra of the Americas alum in 2015. I was part of the Eastern Canada tour and it changed my life. You know, I'm very grateful for every single one of uh, Ilda's efforts for, um, to nurture mu future musicians um, you know, endeavors and to spread the, the message of, of music around the world. And uh, now I'm a member of the Metropolitan Opera. Hey. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, together um, we're going to play this Costa Rican bolero by Jesus Bonilla. Um, it means Liberian moon. Liberia, it's uh, an area in the northwest part of Costa Rica that has beautiful landscapes, beautiful beaches. So if you've ever been there, uh, you're going to know what I'm talking about. And um, and I will be playing with Hugo. My name is Enriqueta. I am a pianist and educator from Spain, from Madrid. And the reason why we chose this piece is because uh, UNESCO a few days ago named the bolero genre um, it, the intangible cultural heritage. And the bolero is one of the most important Latin American um, heritages. And uh, I'm, I'm from Spain, but I remember I grew up listening to bolero. So it's music that crosses borders because that's really the purpose of music. It just spreads out and it's so hard to detain it. And um, I'm, we're happy to bring it here to New York City to you.
after your time at the World Bank, you were there for about a dozen years, you became an entrepreneur. And did you go back to Venezuela or did you, you started your company in, in America? No, I started my company in America. You did? Yeah. yeah. And, and as someone who chose America, what, what sort of value did your company bring to America? Well... Ah, here we go. Let's My company it. ended up producing <laughs> enough profits for and enough income for a lot of people uh -huh. that at one point I calculated that our staff and clients have paid over a billion dollars in taxes. Mm. We produce over a billion dollars in dividends and we produce about a billion dollars in capital gains. That's mm. the value we brought to America. Mm. But more important than any of that, is that we created a, a, a process that was very innovative, that we could deliver value over benchmarks when most people don't, mm -hmm. for reasons that I will not get into, and that um, help fund hospitals, cancer wards, foundations, endowments, universities. So you uh, saw re real value in and the investment real work value, you were doing. And I, I really believe that, that managing assets, if you do it well, not if you do it poorly, is one of the most uh, um, noble professions that you can have. And, and why? Because you're, you're providing stability and a future yes. for organizations and... And people. And people, You're yeah. providing... And communities, and really. And communities. And you're, communities. You're, you're actually bridging the, the uncertainty gap, gap mm. between present and future. And life is very tricky. Mm. Uh, it's very important for human beings, communities, and organizations to develop a nest egg that is well-managed so that you can survive mm -hmm. the hurdles that life throws at you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a number of entrepreneurs in here, and you know, when you are right, running uh, an investment fund, please be quiet down there. Um, when you are running an investment fund, you still are an entrepreneur. So you, oh, yeah, you're very much an entrepreneur. I have a friend here, she's a doctor, and she's setting up her own doctor practice. Like you're suddenly gonna here she is Tara Leah who came in from San Francisco, she's gonna suddenly see, she's gonna suddenly like have her own practice which is a little different from working for UCSF or what have you right like it's like she's an entrepreneur and a doctor. Um, any no, any uh, uh, to that I uh, have to uh, add uh, that to entrepreneurs it's scary being an entrepreneur it's and it is and very lonely. Hard. It's so lonely. It is lonely. Oh God, it so is lonely. horrible. I was just talking about this with Robbie. But it beats being frustrated within an organization. Yes, there so we go. Yeah. Fear, fear is much better than frustration. <laughs> I think that that is, I think everyone, everyone who's an entrepreneur knows that, right? They, they're like suddenly like, oh, I should go get a real job. And they're like, <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. I got I to gotta pivot one more time, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. I have, to, I have to pivot one more time. Mm. Did you, did it ever occur to you, I mean, it must have, you know, would you go into meetings and there weren't many other women there? Yeah, did you care didn't. one way or another? You didn't care. You know, I never noticed yeah. because I was the only woman. Yeah. I started noticing when there was another woman. Yeah. <laughs> And then I did notice when all of the people in the meeting in my firm, more than 50% of the people were women, not by oh, choice. Oh, okay. Um, all by choice, not by political virtue. It was just, they were good. And I understood them, and I knew where they were coming from, mm. and I didn't have a problem with them. Mm. I did have a problem with them, but also with the men. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the and I, we can talk about the problems you have with men and women and what have you, but that's yeah. not the topic of tonight's conversation. <laughs> But, but uh, no, I would not notice it. I never focused on being discriminated <laughs> against because mm -hmm. we're all discriminated for one reason or another, either because we're not good looking or because we're too good looking or because Or you're are, too smart or, or your hair's too blonde or you're your hair's stupid, 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 you know, <laughs> come on. Or you're, you're you know, Islamic or yeah. you're Israeli or you're Venezuelan or Latino. You know, you're always discriminated for one reason or There's another. People something. are tribal. There's always something. So I never paid any attention to that. Mm, There's right, always yeah. a way out of the discrimination problem. Right, just do yeah. better maybe or yeah. make them free. Not notice. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's have some more music, I think, because we have one more music and then we'll do some q and I'm keeping us on a tight schedule tonight, folks. Yeah, keeping it on a tight I, schedule. I should add something that was not said oh, before. Oh, let's hear that Ugo was the youngest musician ever to be hired by the Metropolitan Opera. Wow. Wow. 
Congratulations. Those talking down there, hush up, please. It's very hard for when we try and turn this to a podcast. Well, you get everyone. My name is Everton. I'm a musician from Brazil. And I like to say my musical, like, started this project in Bahia called Neo Jibá. They had a partnership with the Orchestra of the Americas as well. And now I'm super proud to say that I'm like one of the GLI NBA cohort member. So this year. Congratulations. This year I started your journey into the like entrepreneurship and like I'm just feeling super excited and happy for the knowledge that I'm getting from the teachers and the students as well. So this instrument is a, it's called beating bow. It's a risk instrument, like, I like to say that instrument of like resistance from the people in Bahia. So that's the reason I chose to play some music with you, you see, guy. Let's, that's what's gonna happen.
We're, we're close on time, and so I'm just going to take one or two questions. Hopefully, Hilda will not disappear immediately. You'll stick around a little bit tonight. Um, and then we're just going to have a party, you know, get a chance to meet and, and hang out with each other. Any questions? A couple of questions. There must be a few questions. Okay. <gasps> Andrea. I'm going to go with Andrea because she's right here. Well, I'm so grateful tonight to understand these Venezuelans who've come to our country to help with arts education. So, Hilda, I didn't know about before tonight, but Gustavo is obviously coming to New York, and he's had an incredible history of arts education in Los Angeles. Hopefully, he'll bring that spirit to New York. He's one of our graduates of the orchestra. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, Gustavo. Very grateful to you. <laughs> this spirit. But yeah. What is your hope for arts organizations? Because their funders are old. The repertoires are not modern, and how do you think that they should evolve so that these amazing students can feel engaged for their whole life? Yeah, that's precisely why we created the Global Leaders Program, the MBA, because we know that most arts organizations are not well managed, and they need to be better managed. They need to be more innovative, more creative, more aware of the marketplace, more aware of developing new audiences, new programs. That's precisely why we've created that. And to give you an idea of the number of people who have graduated from our Global Leaders Program, we've graduated over the last 12 years more than 500 people who are, on average, reaching at least 1,000 customers. And those organizations, so we've got, we've got 500,000 customers who are being benefited by them. And we have over 3 million in audiences that are being reached by them. And their programs are making a difference in how those organizations are managed. We will be able to give you more explicit examples as, as this is the first year of the MBA program. Before that, we were just given certificates, which were backed by seven of the top universities I mentioned earlier. And, um, and we're very proud that we've added Chicago, by the way because some or, or universities has become so woke in their approach to education that we wanted to bring in, and we'll probably add the University of Austin as well. So, but for now, it's Chicago that we've added. But we have Stanford, we have Harvard, we have Duke, we have Georgetown, we have Bard College, we have McGill University in Canada. Mm -hmm. So the, we think we will make a difference, and we think there is urgency in making that difference so that the arts are well-managed and more intelligently projected on the needs of the community mm. everywhere in the world. Mm. So. Mm. I sorry. agree with you. Oh, yeah. They're poorly managed and the programs are old and boring mm -hmm. and they need to change. And I know because I was uh, the president of the Washington Opera, I cannot tell you my frustration mm. in, in doing that job. I mean, not for profit job. I was not making anything. I was just uh, uh, you know, helping them. And I was in the executive committee of the National Symphony Orchestra, and it's very frustrating mm. how poorly they're managed. Mm. So, uh, yes. Mm. Mm. Any questions down at this end? One, okay. one, one there. Uh, Hilda, I just wanted to ask, has, um, have the Grammys or the National Recording Academy gotten involved in any way or helped with any of their programs with the Youth Orchestra of the Americas? And also, is there a program within your organization that addresses mentorship for the individual careers of the musicians beyond the orchestra? With the last question first, yes. Each one of our teachers are mentors to the students. Uh, so that's one of the valuable uh, aspects of our programs. That although we are online, it's one-on-one -on -one training. Mm -hmm. And there are wonderful videos of a, of a young um, African-American girl in Cambridge, Maryland. Mm -hmm being taught the, is it the clarinet? Clarinet? The flute. The flute. By the head flutist in the flute section of the Concert Gebouw. It is a beautiful video that she put on, 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 uh, on TikTok or whatever, whether it's, what's the word? <laughs> so, yes, they, they, they are receiving mentorships in, no, the, in this program. No, we want a Grammy. <laughs> so only involvement with the Grammy is that we want okay, a Grammy. We're going to go on to a, so, a question that but I But no, have. no involvement. So if you can, if anyone can help us to reach them, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have a final question. 
Uh, were you born with this, a confidence in yourself, or did it? <laughs> did, did you grow into it? I mean, I guess what I'm asking: Are super women born, or did they grow into being super women? I think it's probably. But I was. I think I was born. Yeah. And it's probably the fact that, that I had underprotective parents. Yeah. I had to take care of myself. I see. So no, I remember my father once asked me when I was a teenager. Would you rather people tell you that you're intelligent or would you rather people tell you you're pretty? You're like, I want and, both. And my answer, <laughs> no, my both? answer was, I definitely want people to tell me I'm pretty. Okay. I know I'm intelligent. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 I, I, think on, I think on that, we're going to wrap up. It's a very, very, very brief Q&A. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Book. Do you want it? Do you want it from? Oh, yeah, let's speak about the book. I haven't yeah, spoken well, the book I at mean, all. I'm, I'm yes, plug the book. the book. There is a book. She is. She has well, written a book. Yes. Can you talk about speak about the book. Delivering Wait, Alpha and yes. Some copies by Great. So we have a lot of. Copies. Oh well, I have twenty copies of Delivering Alpha. For those of you who have a true interest in knowing a little bit about, about my life, but more importantly about innovation and how to manage institutional assets well. It's a great book. Forbes, uh, <laughs> Forbes, I'm modest too. Forbes, <laughs> Forbes selected it as one of the top books of the year that it came out, which ah. was two or three years ago. So it is a, a and fantastic book. In her free time, book. she wrote a book as well. <laughs> yeah, I, read, I did write a book. And I wrote a book because I'm a woman and I wanted to make sure that there was a book on finance written by a woman number one, and, and to motivate other women to go into the investment management field. And because I was actually proud of what I had accomplished and did not want that to be forgotten by my children and grandchildren. <laughs> Everyone else can forget it, but I, there is a book for them. <laughs> they, will be very, they will be very proud. I, I have lots of mementos from my, my parents and grandparents lying around here, also in the bathroom, specifically. <laughs> they, are, um, yeah. they are your greatest accomplishment. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they are. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to come up um, from Washington. Don't leave immediately. Also, really, thank you to Templeton World Charity Foundation yeah. for believing in me to gather people together to have these conversations. It is, you know, it, it's an unusual grant, but, but um, like Hilda, I also really believe in what I do, and I think we bring a tremendous amount of value yeah. when we host these sorts of gatherings because people go forth and, and you know, connect and do deals together and become friends, et cetera. So um, nothing can beat putting people... Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, ice cream's coming. Oh, one more thing, one more oh. thing. If you want to remember just one thing. Oh, yeah, one thing, one thing. Okay. One more thing. Ring the bell. Just think of us as someone who is... Hush, who hush, is, hush. Someone who is actively, diligently, energetically democratizing music training and education and artist training in, in a master's and business program. That's what it should be, we should be remembered for. Yeah. And this lady should be remembered. I'm old enough to have attended Andy Warhol's happenings. <laughs> and this is much better than Andy Warhol's <laughs> happenings. Yes!